World War II was ending. The spirit of America was one of optimism. Brutal regimes had been overthrown. Freedom had won. Yet in the heart and mind of Hamilton Rob French, alarm bells were ringing. The church in America that once held firm to the truth of God's word seemed to be weakening. Spiritual gains made by many denominations, particularly holiness denominations, during the great revivals of the 18th and 19th centuries seemed to be under attack. Revival was the answer, and its pursuit became the hallmark of H. Rob French's anointed ministry. This pursuit led Brother French to look for property in South Florida, where he could begin a winter camp meeting, provide housing for returned missionaries, and offer a place for religious instruction. He soon connected with James and Ella Zook, who were ministering in Palm Beach County. In May of 1929, the Zooks had both graduated from God's Bible School and Missionary Training Home in Cincinnati, Ohio. After graduation, they ministered in the Cincinnati area. In 1943, they moved to Florida. Sister Zook wrote, My husband's desire was to locate to a place where his health would be better and he could labor more easily and effectually for the salvation of souls. They did not sit idly by in the Florida sunshine, but began ministering in the city of Riviera Beach. The Frenches did not personally know the Zooks, but as Brother French shared his vision for a winter camp meeting in Florida, he was told about them by fellow evangelist Charlie Bulldog Wireman. The Frenches soon sent a letter which laid out their vision to the Zooks. With their help, property was purchased in West Palm Beach in the mid-1940s. On September 30, 1946, just one year after World War II ended, Florida Evangelistic Association was chartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. The five founding members were James and Ella Zook, Rob and Geraldine French, and Francis French, Rob's sister. The dream of a winter camp meeting began to take shape. The new ministry, however, quickly ran into problems with the local building authorities. The neighbors to the newly acquired property lobbied the county on behalf of FEA, and the county approved the plans. Rob French, however, decided West Palm Beach was not the right place to begin the ministry. The county requirements for building cottages were too stringent. He felt holiness folks would never be able to afford them, so the property was sold. Another location would have to be found. James Zook soon came across an advertisement for acreage in a small town 25 miles north of West Palm called Hobe Sound. It met all of Rob French's requirements. It was large, waterfront, and could be developed without burdensome regulations. On January 28, 1947, a down payment was made to purchase 28 acres on a dirt road in Hobe Sound called Gomez Avenue. The deposit was $480. Two months later, the remaining balance was paid for a total purchase price of $4,800, just over $171 per acre. But there was much work to do. Other than a small trail that ran from the dirt road down to the Intracoastal Waterway, the property was undeveloped. It needed to be drained and cleared to be suitable for a camp meeting. Sister Zook wrote, The first thing done was to clear six-foot wide paths. This would cut down the cost when the surveyors came. Mr. Zook and myself, using snips and palmetto hooks, made these paths. This job didn't go along too fast because of my husband's asthma and one woman couldn't do too much too fast. By this time, the Frenches were living in a cabin they had purchased in Jensen Beach. With the paths cut and the survey complete, it was time to clear land for buildings. Rob and Geraldine took the lead on this part of the project. The Zooks continued living in Riviera Beach, making numerous visits to Hobe Sound to assist in the development of the ministry. The first building on campus was a small tool shed. The Frenches soon moved into one end of it. Sister Zook recounts, We often said of the Frenches that their middle name was Economy. One time when we called, some large palmetto bugs scooted across their galvanized covered table. In those days, we thought nothing of that. They were common visitors. On a sweltering Sunday afternoon in this tool shed apartment, 
Geraldine sat on a cot strumming a new melody on her guitar. As Rob listened, he said, That's a nice tune. Let's put words to it. So was born. There's more with us than be with them. The song soon became the battle cry of the fledgling camp meeting. Due to the end of the war, army bases throughout the country were closing and selling many of their assets. To the Zooks and Frenches, this seemed a golden opportunity. Buildings were moved from nearby Camp Murphy, an army base where new technology called radar had been developed and taught. Other buildings were moved from Camp Blanding in North Florida. Before long, there were cottages in which to live and larger buildings in which to have church and prepare meals. Again, Sister Zook writes, By February of 1948, Brother French was ready for the first camp meeting, but the buildings were not. Friends of the French's came and helped to get ready. With all of the most important things fairly done, we were all here and, according to Brother French, ready for the first camp. Sister Catherine Bloom preached the first sermon. Our Brother French was in charge, and everything moved off just fine with around 50-some people in attendance. I printed off some signs and just put them here and there. Some said, pray. Others, don't criticize. God very signally blessed the first camp. Brother French was the main evangelist, and if you could have heard him in those days, you would have known he was one of the very best. The campers found it a rugged life when nighttime came. Dear Sister French was often up late at night doing her best to help the guests be more comfortable, as the beds and mattresses were not so comfortable. And so it was that the French's vision of a winter camp meeting became a reality. But for much of the year, the campus and facilities sat empty. Bob Fraze, a single young man from Akron, Ohio, came to help out each winter and fell in love with the young ministry. In September of 1955, Bob married Norma Beadle from Cincinnati. After a brief honeymoon, Bob and Norma made their way to Hobe Sound, pulling their travel trailer. Norma describes arriving for the first time. We pulled onto the grounds around 9 o'clock at night. It was pitch dark with no lights anywhere, except for our car lights and the tail lights on the house trailer we were pulling. We pulled up in front of a building and parked in the middle of the road for the night. All we could hear were the whispering of the pines and the roar of the ocean. Both sounds were very strange to me, and I'm sure Bob had to explain to me what they were. In the morning, we were awakened by a bright sunshiny day, and for the first time, I gazed upon my husband's beloved Seabreeze campgrounds. In those days, the camp was very small. It consisted of around 17 cottages, one house, and seven other buildings which were used for camp purposes. I cannot say that Hope Sound and I were love at first sight. I had lived in the girls' dormitory at God's Bible School for six years and was used to a lot of activity. Here, all of a sudden, I find myself on this little campground located in the middle of nowhere, seemingly, for there was nothing else around but thicket. There was no one else on the grounds but Bob and I, and the sandflies and mosquitoes. In a short time, others came for the winter. That was a great comfort to us. Then as more and more people showed up, the time for the February camp arrived. I had now joined Bob, and it had become our Seabreeze Camp. From 1948 until 1959, the only ministry on the grounds was the annual camp. There were few year-round residents, but these primitive roots would be blessed by God. The camp would soon give birth to a college, a church, and a mission. During one of the early years, Sister Zook was tired from all of the work it took to host the annual 10-day camp. She did not make it to the afternoon service. Her husband returned to the cabin and reported, You missed hearing a wonderful sermon and a wonderful preacher this afternoon. This young preacher's name was Steve Heron. Though from Alabama, he was then pastoring in Knoxville, Tennessee. His name would soon become synonymous with Hope Sound as he pursued his dream of establishing a Bible institute where spirit-filled Christian workers could be trained. 
Religious instruction had always been on the mind of Rob French and had been a part of his founding vision for the ministry. His father, Rufus French, had started a Bible school in Eskridge, Kansas, and as a youth, Rob attended that school. Later, when Rob and Geraldine held a revival in the Knoxville area, the Herons and Frenches discussed the possibility of using the camp property in Hobe Sound as a place to begin a Bible institute. The original plan was to house the school entirely in one new building on the grounds and to use the camp cafeteria for a dining facility. During the camp meeting, the school dorm rooms could be used for sleeping quarters for camp attendees. In this way, the facilities would be utilized nearly year-round. In August 1959, Reverend and Mrs. Heron and their daughter Jane moved to Hobe Sound and the next February presented their plans for a Bible Institute to the Seabreeze Camp congregation. Responding enthusiastically, the crowd pledged over $6,000 for the new school building. Later that summer, brochures were printed and mailed, announcing the opening of the school. The stated goal was to provide a place of education and training for young people in an atmosphere conducive to the development of Christian character and ideals. The school would be maintained on the basic principles of the scriptural doctrine and experience of the Wesleyan interpretation of entire sanctification. Though work on the new institute building began shortly after the 1960 camp, it was still uncompleted when the time to start school came. Mr. Heron and others did their best to pull things together for the incoming students by borrowing camp beds, chairs, and dressers to at least furnish the dorm rooms. Sister Heron, a public school teacher in the nearby city of Stewart, took $200 from her own paycheck to stock the cafeteria. No sacrifice was too great or any task too hard. Their God-given vision was taking form. September 30, 1960 saw the first registration for Hope Sound Bible Institute. By the end of the day, 17 students had registered, and by the end of the year, that number had risen to 24. Students represented 12 states and Canada. The vision for Christian education shared by Rob French and Steve Heron had become a reality and a school was born. When theologically sound education and a passion for revival are combined, evangelistic zeal will follow. For several years, Reverend C.J. Goodspeed had been ministering in the Bahamas. In 1959, he invited Rob French and Steve Heron to accompany him on an exploratory trip to the island of Grand Bahama. They were joined by teenager J.R. Hutchinson, who marked the trip as the turning point for FEA Ministries from a winter camp meeting and small retirement community to the beginnings of a worldwide missionary outreach. French, Heron, and Goodspeed visited the islands again in 1960. One of Brother Heron's purposes for these trips was to look for ministry opportunities for the students from the newly formed college. In the spring of 1961, nearly the entire student body made the trip with Brother Heron to the islands. For many of those young people, this trip was the crowning event of the year. Mornings were full of manual labor, chipping stone to eventually be used in the construction of Holmes Rock Chapel. Each evening found the team holding open-air services in and around the community of Holmes Rock. One afternoon as the group sat down to eat, a student was missing, his plate empty throughout the entire meal. Phil Newton, an energetic student from South Carolina, had come to Hope Sound Bible Institute with a burden for ministry. This particular afternoon in the Bahamas, Phil went off alone to pray. As he did so, God placed a burden on his heart for the Bahamian people and gave him a definite call to move there as a missionary. Phil, his wife Betty, and their children returned to the island later that year to begin the work of what was then called Bahama Missions. Different names for the mission would be used over the years as the scope of the work changed, including Bahama Missions, FEA Missions, and finally Hope International Missions as it is known today. Not long after arriving on the field, Phil and Betty received confirmation of their call when an elderly saint of God threw her arms around Betty and said, I have prayed for 20 years for someone to come and help my people. The Newtons were the answer to Drusilla Burroughs' prayers. At first, the Newtons worked largely alone. 
However, in 1964, Marilyn Marchant began to serve in the Bahamas, and shortly thereafter, Sister Eunice Rose Green joined them. These few willing servants were just the beginning of numerous HIM missionaries to serve in the Caribbean. In 1967, Phil Newton qualified for his pilot's license and purchased an airplane for transporting people and supplies back and forth to the islands. This tool put the entire Caribbean within reach, and the work soon expanded, with missionaries being sent to the Turks and Caicos Islands in Haiti. Churches and schools were planted as the ministry grew. Over time, Hope International Missions operated at least 10 different airplanes, with many of the early missionaries being rated as pilots. Mark Vernon joined the team in 1971 and was the primary mission pilot for the next 15 years, faithfully serving the missionaries from the Bahamas down into the Turks and Caicos Islands in Haiti. Mark had served with the U.S. Army in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot. His thousands of hours of experience made him a valuable addition to the fledgling missionary program. Prone to the occasional aerobatic maneuver, each passenger was sure to arrive at their intended destination ready to preach, pray, or die. The blending of a winter camp meeting and year-round Bible Training Institute, soon to be called Hobe Sound Bible College, quickly proved to be a powerful tool in missions. In 1973, when the FEA board was approached by H. E. Schmuel and Delmar Kaufman about the need for Christian teachers in Taiwan, some were already prepared to answer the call. Robert and Marcina Pelton left for the tiny island nation in August of that year. In 1976, Bradley Halter, who had already been teaching in Taiwan for three years, officially joined HIM. Bradley and his wife Anita continue ministering in Taiwan to this day, making them the longest serving HIM missionaries. God's blessing of Rob French's vision to start a winter camp meeting in Florida was evident. By the late 1960s, though still a powerful preacher being used mightily by God, Brother French was approaching 80 years of age. He asked his nephew, G.R., to move to Hobe Sound and assist with the ministry. G.R. and his wife, Anne, arrived in 1969 to both work in the college and to share with his uncle the growing administrative responsibilities of FEA Ministries. In 1978, Rob French's beloved wife, Geraldine, died. That same year, Brother French turned over the daily operation of the ministry to his nephew, and G.R. French became the second president of FEA Ministries. Over the years, as many people had moved to Hobe Sound to be near the school or mission, church services were organized and held under the administrative umbrella of FEA. Various ministers would preach. In the 1970s, Ponder Frederick held regular services each summer for campus residents and the broader Hobe Sound community. After Reverend Frederick passed away in 1977, Robert Pelton was asked to serve as full-time pastor of this congregation. The Peltons were on furlough, having completed their initial four-year term as missionaries. More had been accomplished in the first 30 years of ministry than anyone could have imagined. Within just a short time, 27 Hobe Sound Bible College alumni had been sent as missionaries to the islands of the Caribbean and Taiwan. Thousands were now attending the annual camp, campus facilities had been expanded, and Hobe Sound Christian Academy had been founded. 30 additional acres had been purchased just north of the original property, and a 2,000-seat auditorium had been constructed. As the campus expanded, so did Hope International Missions with families such as the Winghams, Browns, Smiths, Campbells, and others serving faithfully in the Caribbean and beyond. The 1980s were approaching. Writing about the new decade, Steve Heron had this to say, Thank God for all that is being done. It is exciting to see this beehive of Christian activity, but the end is not yet. There must be many, many more sent out equipped for the fight. The door is open. Neither Satan nor circumstances can shut it. Only we can shut the door. Our indifference, sloth, selfishness, and lack of cooperation can close the door and hinder the fulfillment of the vision. What can we do about it? Keep the vision clear. 
Stand firmly for biblical truth and Christian morality. Contend for the preservation of freedom. And one final plea, above all, pray. In the early 80s, FEA President G.R. French was not about to slow down or take it easy. Writing in the March 1980 edition of The Torch, which at that time was published jointly by the college and FEA, he stated, A vision must be frequently renewed, or it will die. Satisfaction with the past and an attitude of holding the fort will result in stagnation. The world is on the move, and the church must be anointed with fresh oil or it will settle for fanning the dying embers of the past. The best defense is an aggressive offense. And aggressive he was. In addition to his duties as president of FEA, in 1980, Hope Sound Bible Church also called him to be the senior pastor when Robert and Marcina Pelton returned to their ministry in Taiwan. During G.R. French's years as pastor, a local church board was formed a constitution and bylaws were written, and Hope Sound Bible Church became a legal entity. Though it continued to help set the spiritual tone for FEA and the school, the church also focused on local outreach, meeting the needs of the Hope Sound community through bus ministry. Seabreeze Camp continued to grow. Soon the tabernacle completed in 1971 was full. The foyer was often filled with people, and others would stand outside looking in the windows. A larger facility was needed. On October 1, 1980, a groundbreaking service was held for a new auditorium with a greatly expanded seating capacity. The laminated beams, some of the largest in the southeast, were constructed in the state of Washington and transported to Hobe Sound by rail. General contractor Norman Brush led a dedicated group of laborers. On Wednesday, February 2, 1983, just one day before camp began, the certificate of occupancy was received. The H. Rob French Memorial Tabernacle was dedicated February 5, 1984, with over 2,500 in attendance. Marking the occasion, G.R. French said, This building stands as a memorial to those who have prayed, sacrificed, and labored over the years. It stands also as a light to future generations for the values of truth, honesty, godliness, and holiness, without which no nation can achieve true greatness. On January 28, 1985, funeral services were held in the tabernacle for FEA Ministries founder, H. Rob French. Kenneth Knapp led the congregation in singing, It Is Well With My Soul and Dr. Heron preached a triumphant message. Later that same year, Steve Heron stepped down as the president of the college, turning over the leadership role to one of the first graduates, Robert Whitaker. Though the ministry founders no longer held leadership roles, the foundations they had laid would continue to produce fruit for the kingdom of God. The mission division of FEA Ministries was set for dramatic growth as the world changed in ways never thought imaginable. Hope International Mission's first major expansion was overseen by a godly man who had grown up in Guatemala. In 1976, Dr. Glenn Reif, his wife Nell, and their three sons moved to Hope Sound from Guatemala, following many years of ministry there with his parents. Dr. Reif taught foreign missions classes in the college, but in his words, the mission field followed me home. From 1960 through 1996, a civil war raged in Guatemala. By some estimates, as many as 200,000 people died in that conflict. Many of those who survived made their way to America, with a great number ending up in South Florida. These immigrants needed help understanding our laws opening bank accounts, and getting jobs. Dr. Reif was deeply burdened for the people with whom he had spent most of his life ministering in Latin America. He knew their deepest need was a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he acted. In 1987, two 18-wheel semi-trucks were purchased. 
Dr. Reif and others outfitted the trailers into air-conditioned chapels capable of seating over 75 people. These chapels were driven from community to community with high populations of Hispanic immigrants needing to hear the gospel. God blessed this effort, jokingly referred to as semi-evangelism. Soon, a young Honduran student at Hope Sound Bible College named Sidney Grant heard God's call to assist in this endeavor. He and Dr. Reif proved to be a formidable team. The Spanish Bible Institute was started to train leaders from among the converts. Today, as a direct result of this ministry, 23 self-supporting, self-governing Hispanic churches stretch from Key West, Florida to Springfield, Massachusetts. To God be all the glory. Other world events were also bringing much expansion to the mission. Rob French had been well known for speaking out on the threat of communism. He had the ability to weave this threat throughout his sermons in such a way that even the saintliest person would be praying to make sure they were right with God. Little did he know that Soviet communism would fail and the small organization he had founded would be on the front lines of sending the hope of the gospel into the former Soviet Union. In March of 1992, just a few months after the fall of Soviet communism, G.R. French, along with James Sutherland, Guy Hester, Darwin Edwards and Daryl Hausman made an exploratory visit to Russia, Czechoslovakia, Belarus, and Poland. As a result of this trip, and many that would come later, missionaries were sent and ministries developed. The Richard Grout family served faithfully in Vyborg, Russia, developing a gospel center. Through their efforts, half a million Russian Bibles were spread through nearly every province of the country. Countless stories of lives changed and needs met can be told as a result of HIM's influence in Europe, a work that continues today in Russia, Romania, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. During these years, Hope International Missions also expanded into Africa when a Sister Holiness organization asked if FEA would assume administration of their work in Lesotho and South Africa. New churches were planted and the ministry quickly grew with outreach into much of Southern Africa through the Bible distribution efforts of Peter and Hester Murray. The work in Asia was strengthened during this time as Jeannie Schwartz and Dorothy Shi crisscrossed China and developed mentoring relationships with pastors there. A radio program produced here in Hope Sound was broadcast all over Asia, yielding much spiritual fruit. FEA has always placed a high priority on the printed page for many years, Dewey Deckard, Carl Vogel, and others poured their lives into operating FEA's own printing presses. As the publishing world changed and on-demand printing options became readily available, the print shop was phased out. But FEA's commitment to the printed page did not change. In 1994, Gospel Publishing Mission began and Joe and Gay Taylor joined Hope International Missions and became HIM's Department of Literature Development and Distribution. The Taylors continue to lead this ministry, which has published and distributed millions of books. After two decades of substantial growth under the steady leadership of G.R. French, he notified the FEA board in 1999 of his intention to resign as president. With 30 years of service in the organization and 20 as its president, he felt it was time to turn the ministry over to another leader. His effectiveness as a visionary mission statesman has forever left its mark on the ministries in Hope Sound. As the year 2000 approached, the intent of our founders continued to be honored with holiness preached and practiced both at home and abroad. During the 2000 Seabreeze Camp, Dr. James Keaton was installed as the third president of FEA Ministries. Dr. Keaton was well known throughout the holiness movement due to his many years of anointed ministry. He had served in numerous leadership roles, including pastor, evangelist, and Bible college president. On many occasions, his powerful preaching had stirred the Seabreeze Camp crowd, and he was well known in the Hope Sound community. Dr. Keaton also had a solid understanding of missions 
having served on numerous mission boards and committees. Dr. Keaton once remarked that the work of Hope International Missions was one of the best kept secrets in the holiness movement. Though Hope Sound actively participated in the annual IH convention and college public relations groups made regular visits to churches and camp meetings in the North, the South Florida location was well out of the mainstream holiness movement. As Dr. Keaton crisscrossed the country, speaking in revival services and camp meetings, he also passionately promoted HIM's work with great success. During Dr. Keaton's extensive travel and preaching schedule, Vice President Daniel Lee assisted with the administrative functions of FEA Ministries. James Keaton has always cared deeply for children. He says, when a child surrenders their life to Christ, you have not only saved a soul, but also a life. The mind is more fertile in youth, so that more of God's principles and love are attained when learned early. While president of FEA, this passion led Dr. Keaton to develop HIM's Department of Orphan Ministries. An orphanage was opened in Haiti. In Romania, HIM developed a partnership with the Maranatha Foundation and helped build the House of Hope in Talpush. Through the years, HIM's orphan ministries have continued to expand. Orphan care in Africa primarily takes place through HIM's churches. Children who lost parents due to the AIDS epidemic have their physical and spiritual needs met and are helped to obtain education. In 1990, Paul and Leela Pierpoint moved to Hope Sound to assume the role of senior pastor at Hope Sound Bible Church. Under his leadership, the church grew in its ministries and influence. When Dr. Keaton stepped aside from the FEA presidency in 2005, Reverend Pierpoint was asked to serve as interim FEA president. In 2007, Sidney Grant was elected as the fifth president of FEA Ministries. In many ways, the organization had come full circle. Sidney Grant was a product of Hope International Missions and a graduate of Hope Sound Bible College. His wife Gretel from Bottle Creek, North Caicos was also reached through the faithful ministry of HIM missionaries. With Dr. Reif, Sid had played an instrumental role in the founding and leadership of the HIM Department of Spanish Ministries. As president, he continued his passion for building the kingdom of God in Latin America. A number of those saved in the mobile chapel ministry and trained in the Spanish Bible Institute returned to their home countries. Churches were planted in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Also during Sid's tenure as president, the HIM Department of Member Care was begun, and HIM's cross-cultural scope and ministry continued to expand. On February 12, 2017, Harold Martin was installed as the sixth president of FEA Ministries. Harold's parents had moved to Hope Sound in the early 1970s to place their daughter in the academy. Harold came along shortly thereafter and attended the schools in Hope Sound from the first grade through college. In 1997, he graduated from Hope Sound Bible College with a degree in missions. After completing training at Moody Aviation, the Missionary Flight School of Moody Bible Institute, he worked at the school for two years. In 2002, Harold and his wife Kayla returned to South Florida where he served with Missionary Flights International as a pilot and aircraft mechanic. When asked to become the president of FEA Ministries, Harold was a captain in the MFI flight program and the organization's executive vice president. Under Harold's leadership at FEA, the missionary team has continued to grow. In 2017, the HIM Department of Muslim Ministries was founded, which focuses on reaching Muslims in the U.S. and around the world with the gospel. The HIM Department of Member Care has been strengthened, and numerous upgrades continue to be made on the campus shared with the church and college. The year 2017 also brought new leadership to Hope Sound Bible Church with the installation of Matt Ellison as senior pastor after Rodney Loper was elected president of God's Bible School and College in Cincinnati, Ohio. As we celebrate the 75th milestone of FEA Ministries, we are afforded the opportunity to do three things. Anniversaries provide a time to look back, 
to evaluate the past, to rejoice in victories, and to learn from failures. We thank God for our spiritual heritage and understand we are simply building on the foundation handed to us by those who faithfully served before. Anniversaries also provide a time to evaluate the present. We cannot live in the past. No matter how much effort is exerted, not one small detail can be changed. We cannot go back to take advantage of missed opportunities or to correct failed assumptions. Rather, this time must be used to evaluate where our ministry is today. Have we remained faithful to the intent of our founders? And more significantly, have we remained true to God's purpose for our lives and ministries? But most importantly, anniversaries provide a time to chart a course for the future. The past is instructive, the present may be compelling, but the future is calling for increased vision, increased passion, and increased effectiveness. May God help our generation faithfully fulfill the mission He has given FEA Ministries as we advance into the future.